Good afternoon all together. I hope you enjoyed your lunch break. And um, I want to tell you how I learned to stop worrying and love the C++ type system, not the bomb, but the type system. And I even quote Bjarne, uh, having the design and evolution of C++, which is a recommended book. And he says, I observed that type errors almost invariably reflected either a silly programming error or a conceptual flaw in the design. And I will extend that to you to say any typecast that happens in your code is a candidate for a better design waiting. So what are types? Let's say if you go to type theory, what you learn is, OK, a type is a set of values and a set of operations operating on these values. And that's actually what happens. And the thing is, in type theory, when that's taught to computer science graduates, or it's usually taught in a means that is very mathematician oriented and far away from what happens in day-to-day -day programming. And I observed students not being able, including myself, not being able to actually map what's in type theory uh, to things what happens in a, in a compiler or in a program. Maybe when you write compilers, you get a little bit more, uh, let's say, understanding of what's, what, what's behind. So if we look at the set of values, if we have a set of different values, we can actually count the bits required to represent these set of values. And that's the minimum number of bits to have these uh, set of values. And that's typically what the compiler does. And why a compiler very often desires you to specify a type, because otherwise it wouldn't know how big a variable would be. And in addition, all kind of operations that take values of your type as an argument are also belonging to that type. And that's not only the member function of your class that you might define, but also all kind of functions that take or might take this values of this type as an argument. And that's a, a bit more than that. And the operations that you can do is actually provide the meaning. When I was a, a, a freshman in computer science, I always confu was confused what is syntax and what is semantics. Semantics is the meaning of your code. So what, what it actually does or what it's supposed to do. And very often when, when we teach programming, and I'm a teacher today, so that's, that means that we uh, all very often expect students to grasp what types are by just using them, which is quite a, not a bad teaching practice, showing how to use the stuff. But appreciating what a type actually means is something that is hard and actually understanding what there is something that I still learn about. And if you look at some historical languages, the question comes up, how many types does the language actually need to support? There have been machine code languages where the only type that was supported was a word. And there have even been programming languages, the only type that support is a word. We have Snowball. Anybody have ever used or heard of Snowball? I'm not sure I'm, I'm bullshitting too much, but I, I got the impression everything is a string. And maybe a string is a pattern, but that's a different thing. In Lisp, everything is a list, it, except if it's an atom. But uh, most of the things, everything is a list, even a, pro, a, list, even a program. In Smalltalk, everything is an object. So you have a kind of homogeneity in, in the underlying system. And that's a simplification mechanism that actually makes implementation maybe not easy, but feasible, at least if you consider the time from when these uh, languages emerged. We have Fortran. Anybody knows how many types you can have in Fortran? Unlimited. We have objects in Fortran array. Let, let's say Fortran 4. That's the last version I used. AWK, <laughs> 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 uh, AWK, anybody use that? Yeah? How many? Well, you have numbers, which are double, strings, and maps. Huh? Regex is kind of uh, in between, yeah, regex as well. So we have JavaScript, which is also a very interesting language. I don't comment on that. We have <laughs> <laughs> assembly language. As I told you, we had assembler when I grew up. Everything was kind of how big your register was. Um, 
Today we have assembly languages where, where the assembler itself distinguishes between, okay, have quad words, words, half words, bytes, and whatever. So we also have already have types in the machine language as well. And we have lambda calculus and other things. So the big insight that I had once was, okay, why were people so, let's say, I lived in the 90s or 80s, 90s. In the 90s, everybody got crazy about object-oriented programming. Who is guilty? Some are old enough to remember that. Everybody, yeah, oh, oh. Why was that, that such the thing it's because it was the first kind of languages where we able where we were able to actually spell out types that we want to have not the things that the compiler gave us and that's that's a big understanding people tend to forget why why oo was so great today because who cares the young ones green shirts no red shirts <laughs> <laughs> and um, my first programming was on the a thing like this <laughs> and they're basic we had actually more or less two types numbers and strings and you distinguish them by having a dollar at the end of the variable name and conversion was uh, explicit some conversion from integers to floating point was implicit but the other way around you had to say something about rounding which way to round and you couldn't actually extend the operation because you couldn't define any functions everything was goes up so, not really interesting types. The one interesting thing, my math teacher, when he got his first, I, I believe it was the, the VIC-20 Commodore or maybe the C64, he said, oh, from the pocket calculator where I have to select which register I put which number in, I now can have names for my variables and the computer will select the, uh, the register where it puts it. Wow, today, huh? <laughs> Second experience, Pascal. And Biana, actually, that BS is Biana Strusov, is, he writes, I had found Pascal's type system to be worse than useless. <laughs> I dare, I know Niklas Witt uh, in person as well, and I think he, he, he attempted well because Pascal was never intended to be a language used outside of campus. It was a teaching language, and it has a kind of interesting but rigid typing system without type punning. And you didn't have any implicit conversions, so everything was clearly typed. And at the time, you had machines with a few K bytes or K words to run a compiler that was a five pass compiler. I've seen the source code of that compiler. Their magic happens, even it's written in Pascal, it does type punning by writing stuff out of disk, or, or no, out to drum or tape and reread it in, in the same position in memory and reinterpreting that. So that's how you do type punning in a Pascal compiler in uh, 1972 or something like that. So we can construct types, we have records, we have even variant records um, that are, have to be discriminated and we have arrays and we have a kind of string with a, which is actually a character array of a fixed size, which was one of the most annoying things to program Pascal with when you wrote some kind of real-world application with it. Uh, I'm not talking about Turbo Pascal, which had decent strings already, but the real plain Pascal. And uh, we all know it's either Muesli or Quiche eaters who, who uh, uh, use Pascal. Then came C. It was a revelation. But it was meant to be, okay, it's from experts for themselves. C was invented by the uh, Bell Labs people for themselves. So the best programmers in the world at the time maybe wrote a language or invented a language for themselves and made a lot of assumptions about the uses of the language that are no longer true. Like, you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a few things that we still suffer from. We get a lot of freedom in C. We can almost reinterpret everything, every kind of bits that are big enough in, at some, as something else without the compiler, uh, uh, let's say, giving us handcuffs or, or giving us a go to jail card. We have interesting things. At early on, we didn't even have to specify function arguments, more or less. You just called something, and if it was okay, it was okay. If not, who cares? And um, the thing is, it worked because people invented conventions like a char star 
oh, that's a string, because it's what you get when you have an array of characters that the compiler pr uh, presents you as literal, and it decays when you pass it to a function. That's one of the bad things about the, the decayed pointers of arrays, because you lose any information of dimension. So you need another convention, either additional arguments, or some magic character in there, which happens to be zero, or null, n-u-l, uh, to figure out where the, where the data ends. And the thing is, the, the power you got comes at a price, but it's very good to do stuff. If you programmed in Pascal before, C is really something, wow, Un until your programs crash <laughs> or misbehave, let's like, say it like that. So it's, you have a lot of freedom. You can do very decent system programming, but it's no, not, not really safe. No, no. So people invented additional tools to work on that. The thing is, remember, C and Pascal were written from very tiny machines. Even your wristwatch has tons of memory more, except maybe for this one, <laughs> and, 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 uh, uh, um, and uh, processing power far, far beyond what, what was available then. And that's the thing. If you, we stick with the, let's say, with the definitions we had 20 or 50 years ago and try to, to use them today, are somehow outdated. We can do better. And but one thing I learned from Modular 2 at university, but what, what was applicable in my C code was you can have you can hide implementation details, which is where types come in. Okay, you can have opaque types, that's called in module two, or abstract data types. You define a type by the means of its operations and not by the means of its data. In Pascal, a record was specifying data. What you would do was somewhere else in your program. With an abstract data type, you specify the operations that you ha uh, are providing, and then you have the uh, how it's implemented. You don't care. This encapsulation or hiding actually makes programs more flexible. It's I was taught it at university, but I have seen so much practitioner code where this was just ignored. And we still suffer from things like that. It requires discipline. It requires some extra work. But it actually allows you to implement the stack differently. And that thinking in the functional, let's say, in the functionality of some data structure of some type, that's an important thing often forgotten. It's not about the bits or not only about the bits. It's about what you can do with it, the semantics. That's the important thing. And actually, it's a simulation what OO languages provided together so we could actually specify how a stack is made together with how it operates. And that's OO. And if you look at things like um, a lot of C code that does, even Unix is object-oriented in that sense because it uses pointers and function pointers to dynamically dispatch stuff. So that's a good thing. In C and in C++, because we fortunately or unfortunately inherit a lot of the C type system uh, things, it can, the type gives us the, the size of the interpretation of the underlying memory, the validity of built-in operators, what you can do with it, the validity of being passed to functions, which is uh, in C++ including the, the overloads of all kinds of functions and operators. And it determines very often what kind of register or memory position is used for arguments and return values, which is the ABI. And whoever sit in a, in a standard library discussion, as Marshall knows, is this an ABI breakage or is that new language feature an ABI breakage? That's, that's one of the big discussions. And some people care a lot, some people don't care. And very often it's kind of nobody actually really knows. <laughs> So in C++, a type system or a type helps us to select the function overload. It helps with instantiation of templates. And we can actually use types to represent values for compile time programming, at least before we had Consex, where that was the only means to do it. And remember, type def, in contrast to its name, is not defining a new type. It's an alias. We, we, we spell it to they better with using alias. And that's, that's important to remember. If you have a type def for int and another type def for int that have different names, the compiler sees this identical thing. 
So type that's sometimes used to give you the impression of, oh, that's a separate type. They aren't actually, which is a kind of a curse of the language. So what is a type system? The type system takes types and provides a meaning to the program. And also it keeps track of the types of the stuff that we have in the program. And when things are wrong, it defines what's wrong and helps us to make our program co more correct. In assembly language or machine code, if you use a wrong type, who cares? Your program might not do what you intended to do, but it still runs. Unless you have some kind of operation that trap, for example. So what's a type system? That's a nice book by Benjamin Pierce. Anybody know? Oh, a few know that. Okay. But it has no C++ code in it. It's one of the few books that gives type theory that is actually approachable. I have half a dozen others that I stopped working after the second page. And this is, if you, if you take your time, you can actually work through it. And as a professor, I have the privilege to have my students work through it for me. And then in the seminar, tell me what's in there. You, sometimes I have to read it as well, but it's, it's very, uh, let's say, you don't have to spend, spend the hard work sometimes. So it, it's about types and type systems and not so much about some, a little bit about programming languages. But the thing is, type system is what the compiler needs to implement. And if you look at type, that's from peers. If you look at the theory, you get kind of math. And some people appreciate that. It's very hard to map from something like that to what's going on in your C++ program. So there are a lot of attributes about types and type systems. And uh, some are uh, opposing things like strong and weak and static and dynamic and explicit and implicit. And you can have all of these properties at once in a type system. And the C++ type system has that. And let's say good C++ tries, attempts to actually provide you strong, static, and implicit as possible. That's what uh, we, we strive for. But we can have, let's say, implicit, dynamic, and weak as well. It's our choosing, and very often people don't think deeply enough or don't know enough about type systems to actually consciously choose. Yes? Uh, John So th the question is, there have been talks about where that C++ has a strong type system, and if you Google, you find it's a weak type system. And that's part of my first half of my talk, what I'm talking about. So if you stay tuned, I try to answer that question. I don't want to, to, to tell you the next 10 slides in one, one answer sentence. So stay tuned. So if you look at strong versus weak, and this is my own, let's say, definition, it might be wrong. So a strong type system prevents misinterpretation of data bits. So it, if there's, let's say, a floating point number, you never get and read it as an integer or as a string. That's what strong is about. And if you have, let's say, a data structure uh, for uh, this is liters of gas, which is my example uh, soon, you will never interpret that as gallons mm -hmm. of gas or as kilometers driven or as uh, birds in a tree, whatever you want to represent in your domain. A strong type system or language with a strong type system can be easier to interpret by humans and tools. And it gives you a clear feedback when violated, even if that feedback is a template instantiation message that goes on for pages. So it's cumbersome when there are conversions required. Oh, I have these liter of gas and now I want gallons. It's not automatically. And it wouldn't allow type hunting, so reinterpretation of data as something else, which is sometimes really useful. A weak one would actually be very convenient. You just don't care. It just works. There might be intricate rules of how automatic conversions happen 
whenever you use something slightly off. Any, any JavaScript programmers here? Do you know all the rules when you get none? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. So a weak type, type system might be too helpful to you to actually grasp what's going on. And if you have data dependence that flow through the system, you have no clue when things get wrong. Or let's say, not wrong, but different from what you expected. Because it's by definition correct. You, if you get a none in JavaScript, there is a definition that says you why you got it. It might just be hard to find out where. And it allows sometimes reinterpretation of data bits and you have what I just explained is the ripple effects to the data flow. When some conversion happens that you didn't intend to and you don't know about it and then later on something, other things go wrong, you have a problem and that you wouldn't have with strongly typed languages. So explicit versus implicit. I think Bjarne's and my complaints about Pascal's type system tends from everything has to spell out explicitly and if you're an array of chars or of, I think it's chars as well, in, in, in or characters in, in huh? Character. character, yeah, it's spelled character, uh, which is also an annoying thing when you don't have an auto-completion uh, editor in the 1980s. Um, you, if it, that array of characters has 20 in them and you want to now have some other array of characters with 30 and you want to copy them over, you have to do everything by hand and manually and when now you have another one at 40, you have another uh, uh, function that you have to write to do that and that's really annoying and a lot of detail you have to spell out. So in Java, uh, I, that, that was the example I came up with, okay, there you actually, you wouldn't do that with string but any other class you would write the class name as equals new the class name again and it better be the same class or at least a subclass. I believe that changed a little bit, but that's the version of Java I last worked intensively with, where you had exactly things like that. You spell out the same thing twice. And explicit typing is very often combined with strong typing, but it doesn't have to go together. And it can hinder writing generic code, as I explained with the uh, Pascal example. When, when things are too specific and there's no leeway in, in just fitting it together, that's, that's a problem. And whenever you convert from one value in one type to another one, even if that conversion would not change the bits, like, oh, I want to that signed number now be an unsigned number, it would require you an explicit function to call even if the compiler wouldn't actually generate code from that. Implicit is what we have now, fortunately, with auto in C++ since 11, where the type of an element can be deduced. There are languages that rely very heavily on type deduction where you almost never spell out the underlying type of a variable because the, the compiler will actually know the type. It's less effort for the programmer. You don't have to spell out everything for example and you can write more generic code by using auto. But it can also be confusing because sometimes the type deduction rules can be quite tricky almost as tricky as with the uh, weak typing where the conversion almost happens automatically. And if implicit typing comes with implicit conversions, that's really when things get interesting. There, might, there are tools to help visualization deduction, it's, uh, but not uh, very often used. And implicit and strong typing is actually what should be combined Static and dynamic. There are perfectly strongly typed languages that are completely dynamic. So what you get is an exception or method not understood in, in Smalltalk, for example. And static is safer. If your program compiles, it doesn't have a type error. That is almost true for C++, but not completely. Exception is things like dynamic cast or exception handling, where, which is dynamic cast in disguise. And there are languages like Haskell that were built or made, built in, in a means where actually if the language stacks, stack, uh, is compiling, is uh, the type text is okay, the program has no, cannot have any type errors. 
And if you look at in interpreters, many interpreted languages have this dynamic type checking because they have uh, uh, things like eval a string as a language uh, uh, expression and then do it. So my goal is to have not don't have runtime errors. And that's a generic rule in programming, especially in C++, prefer static type checks over dynamic runtime errors. Now, what happens if you have a square peg and want to fit it in a round hole? If you have something that doesn't fit, there are many, many things that can go wrong and you want to detect, as I said, early as possible. You might get garbage, you might get nuns, you might crash, you get undefined behavior, which is equivalent to all of the above. You might get null pointer exceptions, which is a common case in Java, or a signal because you did something strange with your value that where the, even the processor or the operating system said, mm -mm, no, no, don't do that. You sometimes ignore it and continue. You might have implicit conversions, which kind of sometimes very convenient. That's why Python is so or let's say scripting languages or interpreted languages are very uh, convenient to use because very often you have implicit conversions or things just work as you expect, even if they are not exactly perfectly uh, fitting. You might get compile errors, runtime errors, warnings, or even Sphenae. Question? No, just a comment. I think there should be one more bullet point on here, and it's the scariest one of all, as far as I'm concerned. You may get perfectly reasonable answers. You might get a perfectly reasonable answer that's still wrong. Or it may be right in this particular circumstance. It <laughs> gives you confidence that your code is correct when it's not. <laughs> okay, you might get surprising results and that's uh, uh, missing there. What I wanted to say is just performance. You might get everything perfectly right because you didn't notice that there's quite a lot of implicit code happening there which is ruining your performance. Let's say if the implicit conversion goes forward and backward between integer and floating point representations while you're doing a lot of computation, that might kill your performance depending on what kind of infrastructure you use and how good your compilers are. So, but, but my goal is having as few bugs going into production as possible uh, and that's one of the things uh, to work out where the type system has. The, the C++ type system has some real benefits, especially considered uh, in contrast to C, what is one of the main competitors is. Our user-defined types in C++ are first-class entities. So they, you can write C++ code with your own types that is as performant as if you would use primitive, the primitives of the language, primitive types. So you can write code that uses a struct to represent a value that is distinguishable, where the struct maps a double that generates code that is exactly as efficient as you would have used the double in the in first place. And that's a big, let's say, that is something where we should thank Bjarne for. He did that deliberately. Not on compilers managed to have that that way, but it's in principle it's possible to get there. We have type safety, unless we are using the unsafe parts. We have type deduction. We have static polymorphism, which is based on types like overload resolution templates. We have efficient templates, not like Java generics or others where the, everything is an object, goes underneath and kills performance. And we have the compile time computation, which is uh, something that might be good or bad, depending on who you ask. And we have the potentially efficient generation of code, which is also a very good benefit of the C++ type system. That's why we should love it. So if we consider, why, was, why do people complain about the lack of type system or the, the hardness of use of type system of, of languages? Today, it might be much easier to, to implement a language with a decent type system. First, there's more theory around. And second, we have so much more powerful computers with so much more memory to keep track of a lot of stuff when compiling code. So type checking costs compile time, especially if you have things like, oh, I need to um, figure out, do automatic type deduction as, on as well. And that means a lot of things going on. 
it costs compile time, but having knowing the exact type of something can give you better optimization. Um, type deduction is expensive. For example, we implemented Swift parsers for, for an IDE, one of my assistants, and he, he actually found bugs in the Apple's Swift compiler because of that, because he implemented it differently, because it includes a constraint solver. There are things where a constraint solver just goes exponentially, then the language go, gives up, even though you, you can, let's say from the language rules, prove this code is correct. Just computing that it's correct takes too long for the compiler to, to get, uh, get there. And that's what, what makes types some kind of, some kind of inherently hard to sometimes to, to implement. And to actually, for systems programming, going, doing really the interesting stuff, you need to break the type rules very often. If you write an operating system, yeah, there are them, some bits you, that you got from disk and you want, to, and you know there is, uh, let's say, uh, some interesting record at that position in memory, you want to say, I want to interpret that position at, in memory as, a, as this record. And that is something, if your language doesn't allow you to do that, you cannot write an operating system in that. And that was one of the goals of Biana, to be able to write operating systems and similar stuff in C++. One thing is to specify a type system and, and let's say, prove that the rules of the type system actually make sense can be a non-trivial thing. There is one proof about the C++ type system that I know of, which only takes into account what you can do with inheritance and virtual functions. And it proves that C++ is defined sanely in that respect. I dare to see a proof of the current state of the art of the C++ standard where we actually say that the type system is sound. It might be, but you, we don't, I don't know. And I'm unable to prove that. I wonder if there have been attempts to do so. It would be, I, I think it would be a good PhD thesis if, it's, if it hasn't been done like that yet. So proving soundness is really hard. It requires you write formula that we've seen before. And if you simplify things to make an engineering trade-off, can either lead to inefficient code, like everything is an object, or it can lead to, oh, we cannot it's, it's hard to, to, to do it better or uh, generate efficient code from it because the rules don't tell me enough to, to actually do that. Incrementally building a language, which happens in C, with C++ ever since, can lead to inconsistencies. Even the best ideas that you have in the beginning, you might come up with better ones and you cannot change stuff because you don't want to kill your user base which is some areas C++ is suffering from the backward compatibility. We are not enforced to use the old stuff, but it's still used and people just want to compile them still with their uh, current compilers. And if the type system is too good, even if you can prove it's perfectly sane and complete and sound, it might still be beyond the uh, ability of your users to grasp. And I think that's an area where we are in C++ right now in some points. So if, it's, if you think it's easy, just do it and figure out. Uh, and maybe you're uh, that good that you can do it. I can't. Uh, theory behind or building your own languages. Who has not built an own language yet? Toy language. Who has who of you that have the hand up have not been uh, studying computer science? Or who of you have not, let's say, I would say everybody who seriously studied computer science implemented his own language at least once. So that's, the problem is there are also people who have no idea what computer science and language theory is about who implement languages and compilers or interpreters. I just say Perl. A CS graduate would have never invented something like Perl. <laughs> so try yourself. Type systems are hard. Now, where is C++ challenged to be politically correct with respect to the type system? There are many areas. I just picked a few of them. 
I would say everything that we inherited from C and still have around is where the type system is semi-broken. It's not completely off, but it's, it gives us hardship as a programmer or user of the language. So what are the weaknesses? Everything that we inherited from C, that's easy. Arbitrary cast, <laughs> reinterpreting memory, type punning, <coughs> char star things, integral promotion. Who can, uh, let's say, by heart, except for Richard Smith, tell us the rules of integral promotion? You volunteering? You want to? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, let's say, let's say I, I have a teaching abstraction that says everything is an end, int unless it's bigger and unless it's a floating point, which is not really, it's, it's kind of the, the approximation that works most of the time. And even that is be beyond a lot of programmers who are using C. And if you look at the uh, guideline rules for safety, they, let's say, they I would say a third of the rules are about how to handle inter integers correctly so your programs don't do get undefined behavior or other strange uh, results. We have lossy conversions that happen automatically, which is mm, kind of things. We have the decay of arrays, I already said that. Uh, and in C, we have things that we, in C we don't have type deduction, but we have that in C++. And even that simple, Code example. Now it's a question to you. If you have a bool and use it in a numeric context, what happens? Well, that's not C, so I'm not as well versed in that. It's C++. Yeah. Well, this is C++ now. Yeah, so so maybe C++. someone else can help us. Marshall will know. What happens? Huh? It's convert to an int. The sinus function is... Um, defined for double. So the int automatically converts to a double and false is zero, that's defined. So actually uh, the sinus of false is zero and that's what this test does. The other test does it sinus from, of true, which is kind of oddish. It's, it's not actually, uh, um, uh, p, uh, what is pi half? Huh? Pi, pi quarter? Yeah. No. Something like that. So, uh, pi, a pi quarter is, is close to something. So, it, it get, get something that's not zero, <laughs> and and close enough to 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 point between point eight and and, and one. So that's why I have the point two. But if we can even do more. We can even take that true value, compute a sign of it, and then. Um, convert it back to a boolean and see if it's true, and it's still true. Uh, interesting if you use uh, uh, other, let's say, uh, use uh, sign of false. <laughs> you, can do, you can do worse. These are the ones that I could uh, uh, figure out. So there are strange things happening in the language, and it's something, do we want that to work? Would be strong. Bjarne says in the in DNE, it's classes make a strong type system. Yes, we have the power. Oh, oh, 1990s. Yes, we have class. We can have our types. And also, that's the stuff I had on the front page. And again, I repeat, every cast in your program is an indicator for a design improvement waiting. Every. And if you have to cast, better do it in a, in a tiny closet where you can close the door and nobody sees it. Encapsulate it. Question? Does that include things like CRTD? What, what does that have to do with... Uh, with well, uh, everything in a CRTD base class does a cast. Cast can run? Yeah. 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 No. no. It's, it's not, it's not a, I, I use CRTP pattern without writing steady cast. Maybe you, you do different things. How do you get the, how do you get the this pointer for the rest of it? But you don't need, you, do, you, you use CRTP without this, you just mix in friends. That's what I use CRTP today for most of the time. 
I have an example, you'll see it in a, in a minute or two. Um, another not topic of this talk, OO is wrong in C++. Use virtual with care. But that's, that's uh, tomorrow's talk. <laughs> um, at least 5% uh, 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 of it. So type conversions are there for deliberately breaking the type system, which is good to have them because you need them sometimes, but it's very bad to use them freely and deliberately. And my observation is, except in a few cases, almost all, all annoying things that annoy me about the C++ type system are based on backward compatibility. And that's, if we look at C++ type system and take all the way of C's type system, we almost are in a strong type system. That's actually what we should use. Forget C. Another talk I'm <laughs> giving somewhere else. Um, some of the problems we already have seen, we have that integral promotion. And very often, even in the standard library implementations, warnings are silenced with arbitrary casts. I have an example soon. The silent wrapping of versus undefined behavior on overflow is kind of so fortunately, we have the means to actually implement uh, uh, safer integer classes, and Robert Ramney did so, and some others. I I'm still haven't got, got my head around how to th do that even better, but that's something I work on. The automatic numeric conversions, the bool case is a kind of a strange thing. I'm not sure why bool was considered an integer. The other way around, let's say, considering non-zero things as true is not bad, but considering bool as an integer is kind of that was a mistake, I believe, that Bjarne made when he did that. I have a question. So the silent wrapping versus UB versus overflow. Do you see that as, we should have operations, or those should always be wrapped in types? Because there's arguments. Uh, what, what, what I would say is you should wrap integers in types anyway, because I, I have, uh, I explained that in a moment. But also the, um, let's say, I would love to have the carry bit somewhere in the abstract machine, which I can't. Mm -hmm. There are different reasons for, for having that, but I have no idea if we can ever be able to, to specify it that we get that. So that's one of the things where the problem is error handling is hard. And generic error handling is even harder. We see the discussion by Herb Sutter where, oh, should we throw or should we not throw? And what should we throw? Is throwing, can th throwing be efficient or not? So there's a lot of things uh, going on. And sometimes you actually want things like a numeric com a computation where you have things, oh, I, have, I can't have a value, or not, not a, rep a, a good value, but I want to carry on, which is not a number. And sometimes, or infinities. It's not really math what you're doing, but it's engineering trade-offs. Okay, we want to carry on instead of, after we computed, let's say, two-thirds of the weather forecast for tomorrow, we don't stop, want to stop our program and just fail because, let's say, one, one cell is, is somehow off because we made a mistake or the program is wrong, and, but the rest is sane enough to say it will r rain tomorrow or not. So another area where we suffer from legacy, I hope it doesn't come as too much as a surprise, is member function qualifiers. We used to have the brown part here with none or const. And there's a slight hole in the type system where none in the old days meant, okay, we have an L value. Except for the case that you could actually call unqualified member functions on temporaries. Which is kind of a strange because it's not really it's more, more ephemeral thing that's there. It just go away at the end of the full expression. But you still can have mutations on that thing that don't live, actually. And this is a hole in the type system. That became obvious once we introduced move semantics, where we wanted to have these grab the guts thing here. 
We say, okay, once we have that, you need to spell out the other tools like reference and const reference. And in some very generic cases, you have that ridiculous thing where you, oh, I don't change it, but I grab your guts. That's something strange that happens, which is, let's say, for some times it would just work because there are no guts to grab from. But it's kind of not a really good thing. But if you look here, we don't have that hole anymore. So if it's our, uh, if it's L value qualified, the member function has side effects. That's what we are saying with that. And it's not able to bind to a temporary, which is good. It prevents that hole. I'm not sure if we should ever make that experiment, but I would dare to have someone to actually try to make the standard library forget these brown legacy things and make everything like that. Which might add a few more overloads to some already overloaded functions. I'm not sure if it works because, again, this might actually be used in practice in some cases and I've used that as well. But it's really something that you, you for example, if you consider operator plus plus on ints, you cannot write five plus plus. But if you have, a, let's say, a member function increment on a class object that wraps something and you create a temporary of that class, you can call that member function on it. That's strange. And the bad thing is they don't mix. Once you have one qualified, you cannot use uh, the others uh, well. They, you, even your compilers warn them. It's just, for example, you cannot, cannot have cons and cons ref at the same thing because they would bind to the same thing, so it's uh, uh, ambiguous and you cannot actually change that. I have a hard. <laughs> so you say if I return an int and I write plus plus on the return value, I'm not no, sure. No, no, you call the function. You get function f and it turns an f. Do f open print close print plus plus. If if I return by value, I don't think so. Plus plus only works on on l values. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's, that's why it's odd. Yeah. The language gets it right almost, but not for objects. Yeah. And the thing is, if I write a function, let's say, if, uh, if I write a function that has a side effect without a in the old world, I might think, okay, I got an L value, so I can return an L value to one of the members, for example. Or even return this as an L value. Just consider shift operate built-in shift operators of O streams. If you have an O stream and call a shift operator that will return O stream ref, mm -hmm. and if you have temporary O stream objects which you can create, like string streams, you can actually chain them and later on pretend that this reference is, is there. As long as you're in one chain, everything is fine. But once you memorize the result of that expression, you have a dangling thing that's another bad thing. Enum. I think we were not brave enough when we introduced Enum class in the standard library. Unfortunately, I haven't been there yet in the standard committee, but I would love to have constructors and member functions for Enums. Because getting a valid value where you operate on enum values, which more or less become ints, and get it back into an enum requires you to jumping from hoops to, 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 to actually make it work. A constructor could actually check that. And they might, and they should be user definable because we have enums even in the standard that represent bit masks. And in bit masks, you operate on the integers, and then you actually want to squeeze that back into your enum variable, which is very hard to, to do today, at least it's kind of annoying thing. It just should work. Well, I should just be able to check that. And things like, oh, I have enums that more or less 
uh, I want to circle around state machine, like a, a traffic light states. I want to uh, wrap around and that plus plus for the next state would be nice, but actually wrapping back to, to the beginning is kind of a thing that I, I can do it with plus plus because if I can uh, implement outside of the enum as, as a separate overload in the, uh, uh, let's say in, in outside of the class, so I, I won't get kind of, uh, um, overload resolution gets slower, but I can't do it for plus equals. Oh, I want the, the plus equals two so to get the, 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 the state afterwards. I cannot implement that outside of the uh, enum, uh, let's say I cannot implement it for enums. And or bit, op bit mask operators, the same, at least for or equals. Some people will say the bit mask should be a separate type. The best itself should be a separate Like Tony Van Eric will say that it should be a separate type. I, I don't agree with it because I think it's just an explosion of type. I mean, theoretically, yeah, but practically, it's just a pain in the tail. So, uh, um, so I do what you do. I, I, I create all these operators with cast to make it all work. It's, it's kind of, let's say, the comment is bit mask should be separate, but it's practice now, and sometimes it's very convenient to have these states. If you go to electrical engineers, they do everything with enaps. Now, next thing, how to better employ the C++ type system? And my take is use strong type wrappers. And I thought, how can be the simplest strong type wrapper that I get? And that's my example. And I also give an example, is, is uh, uh, Matthäus here? Yeah. Uh, why units are not the solution for that? They are a good solution, but not for that problem. And where the standard library fails today, so some blaming. So the built-in numeric types are very bad for abstracting domain values. So the European style of gas consumption, you uh, divide liters by kilometers by 100 to see, uh, say, get the gas consumption is liters per 100 kilometers, not miles per gallon, which is kind of an inverse thing. So we have multiple parameters in a single function of the same type. What happens? You mix stuff up. Anybody not guilty of having switched uh, argument values? Okay, <laughs> at least you're honest. <laughs> um, so no one showed up. Uh, so type aliases don't help. A lot of, let's say in the C times, we used type def for everything. It was kind of common practice. But so what? It did not do help a lot at all. You could still do that. Some people call out, huh? If you look at the function, but not if you call it, then you don't look at the function. Um, people call out for name parameters. I think for C++, we have a feature for name parameters without defining name parameters. And I'll show you in a second how that is done. And very often we have specific computations where things you wouldn't call sign on that consumption value. It's ridiculous like with rule. So the, the flexibility you get with the built-in types is far beyond what you would need for most of the domain values that you work with in, in, a, in a thing. It's also an education problem. Abstraction is one thing that is taught badly. There are a few people who start out with languages like Lisp or, or Scheme or ML who learn abstraction as one of the first things because otherwise you cannot get hold of your uh, parentheses in your expressions. Mm -hmm. And for them, abstracting and naming things are essential property. I wouldn't appreciate that when I was 20, but I appreciate today that approach that these people who invented that and use that still for teaching have because abstraction is hard. Some have the talent, and I consider myself be talented by that. I don't know where I got that from, but for me, naming things, making small things with the name to reuse was always a natural thing to do, even without being taught explicitly. When I handed in my four and four, going back to that example, uh, exercises to the math department who was teaching the course, I made a, a problem where I made maybe a half a dozen functions of it. And the assistant grading it said, well, why did you implement functions there? You could have just five nested loops to solve that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was baffled. I would never have thought about having this big, huge program 
in one nested thing that I couldn't actually see and read or on, on the terminal. So that's that kind of, it's an education problem of abstraction and I have not figured out how to do that well. It is something that should come first. So instead of implementing a loop, you should implement a function when you teach it. So whenever you have a function taking multiple arguments of the same type, it will be called wrongly. That's a fact. We have a problem, but we have the means to solve it. And there's even old wisdom around that, predating most of what we do today, predating the C++ standard. It's called the whole value pattern. Who has heard of the whole value pattern and has not been in a talk by me before? Where he heard it? So the whole value pattern and the language uh, pattern language behind the text, Ward Cunningham, the inventor of WikiWikiWeb, not of Wikipedia, but of WikiWikiWeb. And he did that for people to discuss OO and patterns, object orientation. And he wrote, okay, if we use things that are built into the language that can mean all, represent almost anything, their meaning is almost nothing. If I write double, it can be, can represent almost any kind of value that I care if I do some computation. But it, if I see double, I only see, okay, there can be a floating point value or not a number. It means nothing to if I see it as a, as a function parameter type or return type. And the thing is with object orientation, with languages where we can define our own types, we can actually get rid of that situation. We can wrap them. We can write for each domain value uh, type, we can write our own type and make our programs communicate. We can, in C++, we can do so without any overhead. We couldn't do that so in Java. In Java, double is different from whatever uh, class I invent to wrap that double. We have constructors, and if you look closely at the text, I don't want to read out everything of that, but include format converters in your user interface that can correctly and reliably construct these objects on input and print them on output. And that is, you have things like constructor and I.O., but you would never ever then continue to use beyond these constructors or I.O. strings or numeric representations to hold the same information. Either you have your liters consumed, liters of gas consumed, or you have a double. And these are distinct things. And you don't have implicit conversions. Is that a question, David? Yeah, so when you implement this, it all ends up, often ends up looking an awful lot like named parameters. So why do you like this so much? Because we already have that. But I guess I said this in the wrong way. When you implement named parameters in C++, it often ends up looking an awful lot like this. So why do you dislike one over the other? Is it just uh, the overloading I, of equals instead of the overloading of parentheses? Or? I would say spelling, having it as a type allows me to reuse the type in pl multiple places. Having a name parameter is just for one function in that specific case and just having a name doesn't tell me that the, different, that the same name in some other function has the same meaning. That's just convention. And having the same type is the same thing. So what I'm telling you, consider it. Do not use primitive types like int or double or generic representation type like standard string for your domain values. So writing a function computing the, the gas consumption by liters over uh, kilometers, don't use double. What can you do? The simplest thing is just write struct wrapping a double. And that's sufficient to make your program more type safe. You no longer can call consumption with the wrong secret order of parameters. And if you insist to support that use case, you can provide an overload for that. Oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I meant. These are named parameters, right? Yeah. Parameter-driven is 
going to be in kilometers driven no matter where you put kilometers driven. Which is the same with any name parameter implementation I've ever seen. Maybe I didn't do my research well enough, but let's let's go on. This is better than using double. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hundred percent agree. <laughs> okay. There are some compilers that are taking structs and classes differently from the built-in types, and they suffer. But let's say other compilers can do it as efficiently, and you can even do that trick in C. So even in C, you can wrap stuff in structs, and it's still better, and because you, let's say, except for 1975, we can pass structs by value, which many people have not gotten yet. <laughs> But there are, I've seen code where I ask myself, why didn't they pass a struct by value or return it by value? Okay, so if you look at gut bowl, and that's not a live view, but we see both versions generate exactly the same code. So there's no overhead in doing so. So we, we see this is the version where we put struct, and where we do our computation, and it's exactly the same assembly code than from the plain version of using doubles. So there's no necessary overhead to do so. And even if we go, now look, this is uh, C++, now watch. Oh, that's still C++, no? I tried to, oh no, I have the, I have a version that has C on it. Oh no, that's the other compiler, sorry. Yeah, that's GCC and Clang, and Clang generates a little bit, at least some comment, okay, that was 100. <laughs> and that's the C version, so here we see C, the same code and the same assembly, so it's really doable in C as well. Now, why not just the units library? Matthias, pay attention. <laughs> um, this is a little uh, program that uses the units library where I do the same computation and 500 kilometers driven, 42 liters uh, of gas put into, and I get 8.4 liters per 100 kilometers. Now, if I use the units library to do the same computation, I get a result that says me I uh, produce uh, used 8.4 e minus 8 square meters, <laughs> which is interesting, <laughs> which is not very helpful. <laughs> and the problem is I used the wrong units mm -hmm. because my liters are not volume, which I would use in physics. It's liters gas consumed, and that's the unit. And that's something the units library doesn't pr provide me. And the kilometers are not kilometers in the sense of a physical distance. It's kilometers driven with my car, which is a different unit. It's a domain unit that has, is not the same as if you do physics computation, like uh, energy stuff, where, where it, distance in meters or whatever y unit you use, or... Uh, There's a physical interpretation for that square meters. So you, you can make it make sense. It's like uh, <laughs> if you can do that, I'm happy to learn that afterwards. But that's not something I would print in the... Uh, the square meters is not something I would print into the... Um, uh, Brochure of the car manufacturer against <laughs> 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 so you. So that's, that's where it makes sense to have domain, specific domain types, even when you have a perfectly good physics unit system. You might do so, but uh, so far, I haven't seen a units library that allows me to do that in a very decent way. Yeah, and very often what you can do in a physics computation where you still get a unit always out of it to domain analysis, that was actually what 
Stephen, Stephen Watanabe implemented uh, two years ago here in library in a week. It's in your domain, it might not make sense to do that computation. Now let's get back blaming the standard library, and that's not the one uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, Marshall is working on. So this is somewhere in, I believe it's pushback in vector or something like that, where the computation is, okay, do I, do I need to, to reallocate and move things around? And it computes the size of the vector by calling STD distance, which is a decent thing to do. That's exactly the function do so. But if you look closely, STD distance returns a uh, difference type, which is not quite the same as size type that it's assigned to. So we have a silent conversion, and we just know it works because we know our vector has not a negative length. Yeah, it's, 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 let's say it's, it's, it's close enough. It's a sign type return and an assigned to an unsigned variable. So this thing can turn negative. Uh, well, I guess it can. Yes, this, this thing can return negative if it started with random access. Yeah, for random access. So this is a vector, it's a random access. Yeah, but by the way it's called, we know it will never return a negative number. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, let's say, Contextual knowledge that goes into that assignment. Yeah. Well, you need to get types for that. See, this That's my, my take. So if we, if we compute capacity minus size and compare it with, with that n, now we see, okay, we have a computation that we all also know that it will not be negative, but because these two functions return an unsigned type, the size type, we compare it with the size type to avoid that naggy compiler warning telling us, oh, you have a signed conversion, signed unsigned conversion, that might be wrong. That's my interpretation why that n is unsigned. Because if you look all the other uses of that n, you actually cast it back to difference type. And remember, every cast is an indicator of a design improvement rating. And what's missing here is that Stepanov did the mistake, and at the time it was understandable, to just have a type there for size type and difference type. And the problem is the algebra of unsigned and signed is wrong. If you, let's say, have two unsigned value and subtract them, the result should not be of unsigned type, it should be of signed type. And that's one of the mistakes in the, that let's say, Kerning and Ritchie made, that we still suffer from. So I think the right thing to do here is capacity minus size to return the difference type and have size type and difference type formulate by itself. Exactly. And we cannot do that for unsigned and signed. And I believe making every size signed is the wrong thing because they actually form a, a, a vector space, a fiend space, thing to, to solve that. Make a real example where what he said would not work, that capacity was four gigabytes inside one, and return it signed, and that wouldn't be denied. Well, we, you have to return a signed value that's big enough to hold all the values that you can get to. That's not possible. No, that it's, practice, it's, not, it's not a very important problem these days in 64-bit, and we're perfectly fine, and we're not going to have more memory than 64-bit. Yeah, you're talking about the problems with the arithmetic. The problem is that the types that have been chosen well, have... You couldn't put a cast here. You cannot put a different type on capacity minus size bigger or equal to n. If the difference type has enough bits to represent the value, it's perfect. It might to, not, it, but why not? Well, we know the max capacity and we can just choose a difference type. Just forget that it must be an integer fitting in a register. But 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 you can you can let's say it might not be the most efficient solution to that. But in principle, we can actually wrap it in a way. Once we have these distinct types, we can actually define the arithmetic in a way that it just works. It might not be as efficient, but that 
needs to be shown. We might make engineering trade-offs, trade but the problem is the, the huh? We have examples how to do it. Yes. I think I agree, I agree with you, and now I don't realize if what I said doesn't imply that SVD distance has a bug. Like, uh, if difference type is 32 bit, does that mean it can give you the wrong result? Yeah. Okay. It actually gives you undefined behavior. That's one of the three categories of wrong, wrong result. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So to summarize the discussion for the video, there was a lot of discussion of the weaknesses of the C++ type system that I was pointing out from, from the beginning of my talk. I'll be interested in seeing in your proposed solution. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Okay. So um, it started out at Peter's simple strong typing and now at Peter's Sommerlatz simple strong typing because I changed the revisions and it might get more S's in between for the next version. And the thing is, I wanted to use decent C++ 17 features. I wanted to write code that is as simple to write and as simple to use as possible. And I also want to have the option to mix in the operators to my strong type that I want without any hassle. If, I uh, if anybody remembers boost operators, to have inequality, you have to implement equality. To have all the comparison, you have to imp implement less. And that's annoying. Especially if you have a type like we've seen that just wraps one value, where it's obvious how you would compare that, or at least for equality. And the thing is, in C17, we have the means to implement that generically. And it's called structured binding. It kind of, OK, I show you my guts, so I more or less strip myself and show you what, what I have. But actually, who cares? I have a single value. A double that I use in in instead would be there anyway. But, and it would be indistinguishable from all your other doubles in your program. That's what I, that, uh, C++ 17. And also C++ 17 extended what is an aggregate. I can actually now use multiple inheritance in aggregates unless I put any data in my, my base classes. And that's a good thing to do because that allows me exactly to use CRTP with mix and friends, which gives us good um, overload resolution because they are hidden friends. They are in that context of the class. They will never be looked up at if I don't have that class I use. So that's a good thing. The only bad thing is if anybody comes to the idea to, to allocate them in the heap, on the heap and use base class that you might know about and delete by the base class, you get undefined behavior. It's ridiculous you do so. I asked Marshall and other li central library implementers if they ever dared to care about that with traits that inherit from each other. And they told me, no, we don't care. How do you trace nobody ever? Nobody ever allocates. <laughs> you just use them. Yeah. How did you override something in a derived class in that model? I'm not talking about virtual. I ban virtual. I'm talking about non-virtual polymorphisms where you override some behavior. It's not meant to have deep inheritance. I, it's just one class and bases. Okay. Not like <laughs> you're not, 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 uh, you, you don't inherit from double. Sure. Um, I think. My idea is, is as close to the idea of um, Walter Brown on inheriting from double to add operators to, 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 to have specific things to get done there. So how does it look like? We say leader gas is a strong thing that wraps a double and takes leader gas. That's a typical pattern in CRTP. You, you pass yourself as to your base class to just have a distinct type so that uh, your base don't don't come together. Now, if you look at leader per 100 kilometers, for testing, we want equality and output operator so that I get decent error messages when my test fails. So again, I say strong double leader per 100 kilometer. And then I, instead of saying equal for leader per 100 kilometer and out for leader per 100 kilometer, I made a nice trick thing called ops. 
where you pass the, the class you're talking about and then pass in the template templates, uh, as a, let's say, pass in the templates, and this will just generate the inheritance for all the things. And for kilometer driven, we actually want to compute something. So we have scalar multiplication, and that gives us all the apply, uh, things. And this is actually spelled out more complicated as, as it need to be. I just could use the scalar multiplication implementation and pass up which is double is a scalar and uh, kilometer driven is the thing that we want to pass. But to show you, you can actually do something strange by still using that ops thing. So you have a, 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 a schematic means of even having parameterized templates. The only thing is you have to use template apply there. And now we can uh, program that and we get something things. Um, what do I have it down here? Oh, that's the different um, spelling of what I just explained. Instead of the apply. Now, how how's it done? So the, the simplest thing is the ops thing. Just inheriting from uh, a whole lot of template classes by passing uh, that uh, strong type class as, as an argument. That's simple. Now, the strong thing is, is almost as simple, it just kind of sanity check, okay, is it an object type? So you, you wouldn't uh, attempt to, to use, uh, uh, let's say, a reference as uh, a value, which would uh, make some things harder. And there's another thing that's where this apply comes from. We have that uh, uh, kind of, it's like function binders for templates, for meta functions. So we actually uh, say, okay, the sec second, I fix the second template argument and that's what, what we get from that. And the principle is all operators we mix in using that ops thing via CRTP and the operator classes actually are a bunch of friend functions. Now the thing is how do we get to that val? And can we use these operator mixins if I don't have that val, if it's not spelled val? If we can say every, it's all the time called the value is spelled val. And you can actually download the code is on my GitHub. So, what's the question? I, I didn't strong. understand. It's just not used. It's the typical trick for strong uh, wrappers where you have distinct types for the distinct uh, uh, wrappers that you use. It just makes a different instantiation and it's a distinct type. If you wouldn't have that, all have the sa same strong base class and then you, you lost everything. So second step, equality. That's one of the simplest thing. You have two operators, one delegates to the other. They are const expert friend functions. And the thing is we use structured binding to gap the guts. Remember our strong type is a, is a struct, it's an aggregate. So actually, the strong type is the aggregate. It's kind of liter per 100 kilometers. We, we take the guts, we take out the, the members, which are numbers, and we assume that the members implement operator equals, which we have for double. And we return a bool. And you might consider, why did Peter spell out that bool with a capital B? And actually, I, it's a default template argument is bool. It's just bool that we have. But we have that problem, as we observed, Bool is an integer. And I said, well, with my system, can I make better integers? Uh, better bools, sorry, not better integers, better bools. And I can do, but one thing you lose is uh, the um, uh, shortcut evaluation of, of uh, logic land and or. But otherwise, it's a better bool. It will never be considered an integer. And the outstreaming, again, we take the guts and assume, pretend that the output stream actually provides us with the uh, shift operator. We could do even more with reflection on the, on the type name, but I dare to, it, it would no longer be simple. And we might not know if the name that is used is actually what the user would want to print, be printed. And if you don't use that operator overload, you still can use your own implementation of that shift operator for your type if you want to have a better one. This is just a convenience one, especially for my test cases. Now my Boolean type is again, 
what I Boolean is again a mixing cl class with the Boolean operators, logical and logical or and not. And you never are able to call that with a single ampersand because it's not a bool. It's a real Boolean type that implements these operators. So what we can actually Additionally, if we have our own bool types, well, like the template uh, parameter before, you say, okay, we wrap bool, so it's still the, this bool type underneath, and we had get these Boolean ops, and for convenience, we have an, an explicit operator bool, so we can use it wherever we would use Boolean values, except for, let's say, the not very useful use of bool. And we can even have our CMP and equb use that bool type instead of our defaulted bool version. Now, we already had that discussion with vector space and affine space. Let's skip that. We know that's problematic. So how do operations in a uh, linear uh, space? We have scalar multiplication. We have additions, which means plus minus, maybe for convenience, unary plus unary minus. Uh, increment, decrement, which are all kind of additive operators. We have that by combining all the ops together. An affine space consists of the additive, additive operators plus scalar multiplication plus equality plus order. If it's one dimensional, it's, it's good. Or, yeah. Now, for a vector space, we need an origin. A typical origin is zero, which is okay. But we might have other origins. So we somehow need to, to squeeze in that origin thing together with affine space. And I, the only means I've figured it out it might be better was to have a type giving me that origin as a function call, uh, as an fun uh, overloaded uh, function operator. There might be better means to do that, but I, that's the one case where I could actually make it generically work. And we have... Uh, in the vector space, we have again addition, addition, but if we uh, with the affine space, so in, in both ways, we cannot subtract the vector space from the affine space value, only the other way around to make it. Uh, but if we subtract two vector space values like capacity minus size, we end up in the affine space. And that's the correct way to compute things like that. And that's the problem that we don't have the arithmetic with size type and difference type today. And maybe next year I can make a talk on how that works with my implementation of the STD array. But that's the simplest thing to work with. So now the thing is we are in the center of physics, so where we have uh, Kelvin, not Kevlin, which is also an inter interesting name, and Celsius, and Kelvin is simple, it's the vector space over the degrees with that defined by Kelvin, but which start as zero. So the default uh, a zero is okay. But Celsius, we have a Celsius zero, which is actually 273.15, I hope that's the correct value, of Kelvin to start from. And so we create the vector space for Celsius, which is actually degree, based on the affine space degrees. And the Celsius zero, and we have the operators equality, order, and output. And we can actually have uh, 20 degrees hotter, which is, makes sense. It's hotter duration, the same thing. And we have the spring temperature of 15 Celsius, which is almost correct today. Um, and we say, OK, we want spring plus hot, hotter. We get a hot top temperature, which is actually 35 Celsius. And X has the correct type. It's Celsius. We can test conversions, we have Kelvin and Celsius and convert the, cell, uh, the, the mild temperature, which is 20 Celsius, to Kelvin and we expect it to be 293 Kelvin and that's also the test that we can write. And here I was guilty having two tests in one, two checks in one test case, which I shouldn't have done, but I still do that to, to check the opposite thing as well. And we can even have a generic conversion to a template that more or less works because that's how you do that, get from uh, one vector space to the other with the uh, correct computation. And that's, uh, that's from Wikipedia, so I, it just, 
it's it's the correct computation. I know that was the correct computation. I'm just thinking about overflow. <laughs> I don't care about that. That's a different thing. That's what you put in as your base type. If we would use safe integers, we can get there. I haven't tried that. Just time was too short to. to uh, and this is the version on on Godbold, and you st we still get. The, the same code that is much safer now for our guess example. Now, trick question, who spots the performance bug in my code, which the compilers couldn't get rid of? Nobody complained before. It's in the original version. What's the performance bug there? Come on. Yeah. Multiplication is can be much much quicker than division, even for floating points. So it's that's why computers are not math machines. It's kind of engineering. So outlook and takeaways. I need more test cases for my PSSST. Maybe making another S. Psst, so that's good. Um, I need more experiments. So maybe library and we can work on that. But maybe next year. But maybe in between, I do something about it. I want to uh, attempt experiments with sa safe numerics by uh, Robert, or maybe some other version of a safe uh, integer or safe numeric library. Um, Microsoft is challenged because they have special rules for class types, in contrast to the regular types. The ABI is, I would say, a, a broken legacy, which is I, they dare not change because of all the DLLs, but it's something that uh, to consider. Um, I, I, I say you shouldn't care about that too much. You still can compile with Clang today on, on, on uh, Windows and or GCC. Learn to embrace your language type system regardless what language you're using, even if it's not C++. Learn about and apply the whole value pattern. Take a look, figure out what's in the Czech language. It's patterns tended to, let's say, write up Wisdom collected over years that tend to have a very long lifespan. In the late 90s, everybody was patterned, so everybody came out had pattern in its title. I'm guilty of two of them as well. <laughs> and today it's more or less forgotten. People take our oh, patterns, yeah, that's a strange gang of four or gamma book design patterns, not even care about it, what's in there any longer. It's old stuff. But I can tell you. Our pattern book, the first one that I co-authored in 1995, 96, it, it's, it copyright is 96, is still selling. And not only to my students. <laughs> <laughs> so there is wisdom in there. Even the examples might not be up to date. The underlying principles are still there. And a good pattern will tell you the trade-offs, which is very important. It's not like, oh, I do singleton because everybody, that's the first thing I got taught and that's I'm using. No. There should be trade-offs. So Gang of Four is guilty of not having the trade-offs. We tried hard to spell out the trade-offs of the, each pattern to make you more conscious design. Use strong type wrappers, either DIY or from all the others who presented them at the different occasions. And do not confuse the units framework with the strong type wrapper framework. It's not the same. Both are useful, but it's not the same. They might be implemented on top of each other, I don't care, but it's not just units. It's your units. And that's it. And I'm just in time for questions. <laughs> or objections. David? All right. We can, we can take this discussion offline at some point. <laughs> just tell me when to stop. But basically, what you've done now is you pinned a type, a structure, to the purpose. Right, so you have kilometers driven is the purpose, and then the structure is this double with operator overloads change, right? Which to me is how I think of, and maybe this is not how other people think of it, but to me that's how I think of name parameters. It's a name, which is like a tag for its purpose, plus a type that is has the correct operator on it. So this, the strong type is the second part, and then the tag is the name parameter. Uh, so maybe, is that an uncommon view of named parameters? Maybe I'm just thinking of them the way that I'm not having heard enough of your talks. Maybe we are. Maybe my understanding of your idea of named parameters is 
too far away. When I see name parameters, I come from my impression that I had with other languages who provide them. And I think maybe we're talking about exactly the same thing without understanding each other. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. And maybe there's a slight difference that I cannot appreciate yet, so I need to learn about that, but I, I didn't have the time to do so. So, so the slight difference here is that tying a representation as a double to the purpose, rather than tying a representation as generic concept of floating point, or generic concept of numeric to the purpose, is, is slightly more general, uh, slightly more functional, and, and more powerful. But the thing is, I, I think the most important thing what I do is I deliberately select the amount of operators that you're allowed to do. And that's, if you just we say, huh? We agree on that. Okay, I, I haven't seen that, uh, uh, let's say, how do you say that? That uh, uh, narrowing of operate, uh, possible operations I, I didn't see that in, in my understanding of name parameters so far. Maybe it's, I ha but, but I haven't read the papers, so that's. May, may I stop you, interrupt you? Can we have that discussion offline? There were a few more um, hands, and I want, we are just over time, but I want to give them the, the chance to ask uh, me I in public. Was, I was going to ask them after. Okay, <laughs> then, that, then, then do that in a break. But there's another hand behind you. Okay. I, uh, so I just want to quickly note that if, you're, if you like this talk, there are three other really good talks, uh, one by Barney Geller that was just given at C++ Summit, and then another one by Ben Hart that was given at Uh, it is a strongly typed language if you, let's say, like take your tiny closet like this one and put everything that's not strongly typed in there and <laughs> 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 that's how to do it, encapsulate, encapsulate. So Tob Tobias, one last question and then we, we should be... So proof is done by, by uh, it, we cannot prove it, that's good. Yeah. For a mathematician, but not good for a language implementer. No. <laughs> I think we should stop now and, and take a break. Thank you very much.